So what I've reviewed, I've reviewed the challenges in making robust estimates of cost effectiveness. I've reviewed a bit more briefly the challenges in then using that information as part of your priority setting system. I now should close, I guess, with some of the potential advantages of the economic approach. Now, whether we call this an advantage or we call it a sort of belief or an assumption, let's call it a belief. The belief is that if you can take decisions on a more consistent basis, you'll have better use of scarce resources. And the whole drive of using an economic approach is to try and make the series of decisions uh, take these decisions on a consistent basis. And so the expectation is by using um, this economic information, you will end up with better decisions, better decisions in the sense that from our limited resources, we get more benefit. That's the belief. Of course, what I've just been talking about, the idea that cost effects and thresholds and budgets are out of line is just the reverse. We're not getting better um, use of resources, if, if that's true. Uh, another potential advantage of an economic approach is it does give the opportunity for really quite widespread stakeholder engagement. Now, I haven't emphasized a lot of the processes taking place. But, for example, manufacturers are heavily involved because they produce the evidence. They produce what they sometimes call a sort of evidence portfolio, or more in marketing, they call it a value proposition uh, about what their product offers. Uh, so yes? That uh, in, now they may pursue some, like uh, the precise medicine, for example, that new drug is not, uh, uh, how can I say, effective, uh, if have the efficacy to all of the, to the, the total patients, mm. but so they uh, go that to some, some group. Yes. I, I just uh, wonder whether the cost effectiveness research to, how can I say, identify some subgroup which is uh, have, uh, very good uh, cost in some Right, yes, um, sometimes called precision medicine, sometimes called personalized medicine, stratified medicine. Yes, it's a very interesting area. We're gradually learning more about precisely which patients will get the benefit from a particular drug. Now, this is a very exciting proposition because right now, with some drugs, a lot of patients don't get much benefit, but they may experience quite a lot of adverse effects. And of course, as a system, we experience the cost of treating them, but not getting a benefit. Um, it's not clear whether precision medicine is, is going to improve cost effectiveness. Uh, it's, it, it, it works on the, the quality side. Um, if you've got a good biomarker, and you can target your therapy better, you then don't treat people unnecessarily. You don't give them adverse effects. So the net effect on qualities is better. What happens to the costs is less, cle un is less clear. Um, with a lot of these therapies, you continue using them until there's no evidence of benefit or the patient progresses, which is often the, the sign there's no evidence of benefit. But if, if they don't progress, you keep giving them the drug. And so it, what's not at all clear is what the change in costs will be. Uh, with targeted therapies, it looks as if the cost per patient will go up because um, those patients you would have stopped giving the drug, you don't even start. Now you've got um, biomarkers. So the patients you're giving the drug to are going to go on longer and get more of the drug. So we've got a situation where qualities are going up slightly, but 
costs are also going to go per patient are going to go up. And uh, the question is, which is going up faster? If the costs go up less than the qualities go up, it's becoming more cost effective. The other way around, it's becoming less cost effective. We don't know the answer yet. Um, I've got a PhD student researching it just now. Uh, we'll come up with one answer, I guess. I'm not saying it will be the final answer. But it's a very interesting area because there's a huge push on to encourage um, precision medicine, personalized medicine, targeted therapies. And uh, what I'm less clear is whether it's a sort of real advance or it's more something sort of marketing. It's also, universities love it because you've got lab after lab um, happily searching for biomarkers and testing one and knock down, mice knock down models as you knock out one thing or another. Um, so it's very exciting from a search point of view, uh, but I, I think it's too early to say if it's going to absolutely transform medicine. See, this will be on YouTube uh, next year or whatever, and then people in 20 years time can play it back and say, look at this idiot. He thought it was marketing. He didn't realize it was going to transform medicine forever and ever. I should probably record two versions where I speak very positively about precision medicine and of course how it's bound to change life. <laughs> but it's a good, it's an interesting question. It's a very interesting area. Right, um, another potential advantage is, oh, and actually while we're on opportunity for widespread stakeholder engagement, it, you can give patient groups a lot of access to the whole system. Um, and, and at least in England we do. And clinical groups as well. Clinical experts get a good opportunity to give evidence. Increased transparency and contestability of decision making. If you don't have explicit processes, such as you require when you look at economic evidence, you have much less transparency. Decisions are taken, but you don't really know why a decision was a yes or a no. Um, if you wish, you can go on a nice website and see exactly whatever, there's some reda redactions because of commercial confidentiality, but in effect, you can see exactly what evidence a committee has looked at when it made a decision. When you read the guidance, there's a whole section of guidance which explains why the committee made the decision it made. So the system is much more transparent and also it's contestable. Uh, there's an appeal system whereby if a manufacturer or a patient group don't like a decision, they can contest it. And uh, if not get the decision changed, they might get it looked at again, which may then change a the decision. Another one is arguably there's less opportunity for regulatory capture. So I mean, that's a sort of jargon. Regulatory capture is where if you've got a Ministry of Health makes decisions on new drugs, and you've got a powerful medical lobby or a powerful pharmaceutical industry, over time, through various mechanisms, the, uh, the decision-making body gets captured. They sort of begin to fall in line with uh, what their client group, maybe the pharmaceutical industry, want. Now, there's less opportunity for that if you've got an explicit system of health technology assessment that's looking at the costs and the benefits, that is publishing the evidence, that is indicating how and why a decision was made. Another possibility, a possible potential advantage, is it can provide a means of establishing an acceptable price. You know, what should the price of a new technology be? Well, one guide to it is if we know the cost effectiveness, in other words, if we know um, the benefit, additional benefits produced at what additional cost, we can begin to have quite an informed discussion about price. A major element of the cost effectiveness will be the price. It's not the only driver, of course, but a major driver is the price. Lower price, 
more cost effective, higher price, less cost effective. And so using the economic approach of looking at things like cost per quality gained can at least guide you to a, a price limit. You could say, well, above that price, this is not going to be a good use of resources. So that might be useful. The final thing I've got here, it's more of a, well, I stress the potential advantage. We don't have good evidence on this, but I suspect health systems with well-established health technology assessment processes can obtain lower prices for new technologies. Uh, the evidence of that is in Europe where HTA is quite widely used. The prices we are paying for new drugs are significantly lower than the prices, for example, in the United States, where they don't have anything comparable in terms of HTA processes. Now, if that is true, that's quite an advantage. I don't, unfortunately, know how to, comp I don't know the comparison between prices in Japan for new drugs and the comparable prices in, say, Germany, England, France, the United States. It would be very interesting. Uh, I suspect Japan pays quite high prices, but then, of course, taking the system as a whole, every two years you can negotiate down other payments in, in the health system. And so um, uh, it's not all bad news. So let me just be absolutely clear here. I want to call these potential advantages. I think it would be reckless of me to sort of be absolutely categorical and say, you know, these are advantages that um, you've really got to, you've got to, you, you, you really must embrace health technology assessment. You've got to take the economic approach and then get these advantages. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing a sort of sales pitch. I think these are potential advantages of an economic approach. So in summary, um, and I'm actually going to finish on time. This is luck rather than judgment, but there we are. I'll claim credit. This is an important topic. It's big sums of money. It's health. We all care about our health and other people's health. So it can't really be more important. It's very exciting because it's rapidly evolving. Now, I, I haven't really maybe got the flavor of that across, but I, I started on a nice appraisal committee in 2003 so I've been doing that particular role of looking at new drugs for um, 15 years. And things have changed so much in terms of the sort of evidence that's available, the methods that are available to look at that evidence. Um, and they continue to change. Now, as I've emphasized throughout these lectures, there are numerous challenges in terms of methods. There really are. I mean, I guess you guys haven't been very exposed to the methods before, and now you're probably coming away thinking, oh, I thought it was more robust than that. This is terrible. They're taking decisions on, on that? They've asked the general public to do a time trade-off, and that's determining what drugs are available? You know, I can quite understand you might feel that way, and I think it's a fair response. Um, what I haven't gone into a lot of is the sort of processes. I've, I've emphasized more of the methods, but there's also numerous challenges on the processes. But I would like to claim that the potential benefits from a successful system for determining healthcare priorities are large. So it's a sort of prize worth working for. And uh, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, good. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>